everybody. Thank you very much for coming. We're all here to get enlightened, to learn, and to share. You know, there are museums on Babylonian Jews, museums on Sephardic Jews, testimonials being recorded for all of us to see and hear. But here, ladies and gentlemen, we've got it all in-house. We don't have to go anywhere. We've got our own encyclopedia. So, so I'm really very, very happy to have Sami Sorani with us this morning. He gracefully, gracefully accepted to, to speak to us, which is really a wonderful thing. Um, we're very fortunate because Sami is a wealth of information on any subject that you can think of, anything that has to do with Judaism, with Sephardism, with the Iraqi Jews, etc., etc. Um, he's always able and willing to share, to, to teach in order to keep alive and transmit this knowledge to future generations. And I'm very, very happy to see your amongst us some young people who will hopefully encourage other young people to come at our next um, next event. Uh, Sami said to me when we were discussing this lecture, and I'm just quoting, the goal here is to plant in the heart of the audience a sort of understanding of Judaism and how it survived over the centuries and the magic factor that kept us together despite the hard times we had. This way we can promote the main mission of the synagogue to understand the past and think about the, fu the future. In addition, in addition to that, Sam will explore the contributions of the Iraqi Jews to human society. So let's all welcome Sami, please. Thank you, Rose. Uh, I'm very glad to see so many people interested to have a look at the past. The past that we are going to talk today is not one year, not two years, it is 2,600 years. From the first destruction of the, uh, the state of Israel in Samaria, where uh, the king of Assyria took uh, the people leaving there, the Jews to north, to northern Iraq, to Nineveh. Then the other uh, time, at the year 586 BCE, when, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar exiled the Jews from uh, Jerusalem to Babylon. And this is the longest the longest diaspora in the history of a human being. It lasted almost... Louder, please. Ah, okay. It lasted almost 2,600 years. Now, how it happened? How we people uh, stayed Jews all the time? What is the secret? Now, let us go to the background of the situation. Let us look at the geographic situation at that time. In fact, at that time, the, uh, the map of the world was different from the map of the world today. The Persian Gulf did not end up in Basra. It ended up in ur Kazdin, the city where Abraham used to live and where he lived from there to Haran. ur Kazdin today is a, a place full of ruins. Nobody takes care of that. It is beside the city of uh, Okay, the, it is beside the city of Nasiriya. The Nasiriya was a place where our friends, the Shaheen family, used to have a farm there. Now, let us, in that, at that time, there were four contenders, four big countries in the world. Egypt wanted always to capture places. Babylon always wanted, wanted the same, Assyria, Northern Iraq, the same, and Iran. Those four people, for those countries, they always wanted to fight and get a piece of land. There are all kinds of reasons why they did that. Egypt, for example, wanted to find a buffer against Babylon. Babylon wanted to find a buffer against Egypt. And Babylon had a lack 
of manpower. Because all these places, which is called Babylon, was empty. They don't have enough people to put. As far as Iran is concerned, Iran was in fact not one country. It was different kingdom, and each kingdom is uh, ruled by a king called Shah. The uh, the uh, the change of of Iran to one country came in the year 1500 and something. So uh, this is the situation. Now, as far as Babylon is concerned, let me have a few words to describe Babylon. Babylon, that's the name in English. In Hebrew, it is called Babel. Babel is a word that has two meanings. Babel, which means the gate of the Lord. Babel, the other meaning is confusion, and really it's a combination of both. Babylon was a country at that time. Uh, it was ruled by the Chaldeans. Chaldeans came after the many races that ruled Babylon and disappeared. For example, in the year 5300 BCE, the Sumer ruled Babylon, and they were the people who introduced the writing. The first time in the world that writing was introduced was in the year 5300. It was cuneiferous. They have a tablet of clay where they put all kinds of symbols and burned it. And when it is burned, it is kept for life. But the Babylonian, if, if we see Babylon at that time, we see that it is a real paradise. It was full of uh, data trees in the millions, and full of fruit trees in the thousands. The water was plenty. The level of the water, well, because it was close to the sea, the level of the waters of the rivers come up, increase, uh, the level comes up during uh, six hours and then comes down. And during this six, six hours, when the water is up, all kinds of fish came from the sea and went to the rivulets of the Euphrates and the Tigris. When the water is down, the fish cannot go back, so the people can harvest the fish for as they like. Uh, the, the trees of the dates has certain kind of characteristic. Uh, one tree is male, one tree is female. The tree gives food for seven years. At the end of the seven years, it starts dwindling. But what happened, by the side of the tree, a new shoot comes out, showing that a new tree is coming. The, the, the farmer used to go on the male trees, take the uh, colon, the pollen, and spray it on the uh, female tree. And this way he, he can have better crop. And people use that pollen in medicine from the very, very old times. Uh, the, when I read books uh, written by Jewish or non-Jewish doctors at that time, they say this kind of pollen is good for men that have difficulty in passing their water. Now, today we call it a prostate. But in the old days, they have no terminology like that. They use that pollen, they drink it with water. And today, you find something similar in the market. It's called su palmetto, which is more or less the same stuff that they used thousands of years ago. OK? Babylon had, was an advanced country. They were advanced in astronomy. They knew the, the movement of the stars. They knew the, some mathematics. They know the certain shapes in geometry. The circle, for example, they know it has 360 degrees. They know the shape of triangle and the shape of uh, uh, square. And this is something advanced in those days. On the other hand, they have also a very good system of timing. They divided the week into seven days and they divided the year into 12 months. The 12 months that we use today in Hebrew, they are not Hebrew names. Those are Babylonian names. For example, the month of Ab in Babylonian is called Abu. The name of Elul in Babylonian is called Elulu. 
because the words and the Kildanian always ends up with O. So we accepted this system from them when we were in Babylon. Now, one thing Babylon did not have, which is very important, Babylon did not have a system of marriage. A man can have several wives, they are women, they are not wives, and once a year they took them to the market and auctioned them. He can buy a new, he can sell, he can keep up, whatever. There was no system of family and no system of marriage. And that was something very uh, hard in any society if there is no family. Now, the Jews, at that time, the Jews had one country, the country, uh, found one state. Samaria and Judea was one country. Then after the year 1934, after the death of King Solomon, there were all kinds of uh, misunderstanding among the Jews themselves. So finally, the state was divided into two. Samaria was called Israel, and Judea and Jerusalem. Now, each country was ruled by a different king. Samaria was ruled by a king with his, his name was Ahab. Ahab wanted to compete with Jerusalem. What he did, he wanted to uh, make up all kinds of agreement with different countries. He married the, the daughter of one of the Phoenician kings. That, her name was Isabel. Isabel told him that to compete with, with Jerusalem, he had to build up a sort of a uh, temple similar. And instead of having the God Elohim as the master, of, as the God of the Jews, he can use the name Ah uh, uh, Baal, which is the name of the Phoenician uh, God. He agreed, unfortunately. Then, after a while, she convinced him for our God, the, uh, the Baal, we sacrifice a human being. She said to him, well, look, you have six sons, why you don't sacrifice two for the Baal to show that you are really interested in making peace in the area? And so he did. So all the rabbis and all the uh, prophets at that time were very upset and insulted Ahab. Now, what happened? Uh, the the, uh, the Assyrian that were in North Iraq advanced, they wanted to get rid of the king, of the Jewish king. And so they did. And they took all his population, most of his population, to northern Iraq. They settled in different areas, but most of them disappeared within time. They have no leadership, they have no organization. Those who are left, uh, they are left living in uh, mountains as well as in uh, valleys surrounded by mountains. They were totally isolated from the world. And they developed their own way of life. And even in our time, they still speak Aramaic, the same accent that was spoken in the days of Moses, imagine. Uh, there, were, there were very little books written about them, but if you want to read a nice book, which is recently written, it was written by the son of one of my friends, uh, Professor Yona Sabba. His, the, his son, Ariel Sabba, wrote a book, my, uh, my Father's Paradise, and he explained how the Kurdish Jews lived in that area. It's very interesting, and you will find it something uh, quite different from our life. Well, they stayed like that, and they were they become uh, expert in agriculture of mountains. And one of the things that might be of interest to you is that they raise uh, walnut trees, and the walnut trees, when the walnut is on the tree. Around the shell, the hard shell, there is a soft shell. The Jews, they took it, they took the soft shell and put it on their lips. The woman put it on their lips. It gives them a sort of a permanent lipstick for at least three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and they continued that until our time. And the color is uh, uh, a sort of a brownish purple color. It's a very nice color. Well, at least here someone can do that. 
Anyhow, they were also expert in harvesting the manna from heaven, because in the mountains the manna comes in March, April, and they harvested that and sent it to Baghdad for the Jews to process it. So Anyhow, which, now... What is the manna? Manna? Yeah, what, what is the manna? The manna, it's something they, they wake up in the morning and they find there is a crust on the ground. The crust becomes very solid and you need a sledgehammer to break it. It's very heavy. So they took it to Baghdad and there it was boiled with water for a long time. When it boiled in water, the color turned from greenish, uh, brownish to white. And they take the white stuff, mix it with uh, starch and make out of it a sort of a, uh, what is called a dough, dough. And they uh, make out of it all kinds of, uh, of uh, patties. Uh, with uh, almonds and with pistachio and eat it. And that's, if you eat one in the morning, you feel very strong the whole day. <laughs> okay, now, what happened later on? Uh, the Jews of northern, uh, northern Israel, uh, the, from the state of uh, uh, Samaria, were already gone. The Sanharib, the son of the previous king, came to get rid of the Jews of, uh, of, uh, of Jerusalem. He advanced with 185,000 soldiers. The king was couldn't know what to do. He called Jeremiah, the prophet, and he said, look, we can hardly have one tenth of soldiers to defend ourselves. We are going to be defeated. Jeremiah looked at him and he said, I guarantee you by tomorrow morning, 185,000 soldiers will die and your soldier will never lift a sword to defend the city. The king couldn't believe it. But the following morning, exactly what happened? How the 185,000 people died all in a sudden? you know, and without lifting a sword. Well, let me go a bit out for from the subject. There was a Jewish, uh, a Jewish scholar in uh, Russia. He was a medical doctor, he was a astronomer, and he was a physicist. He wanted to find out if there is any scientific reason to that. He looked in the Bible, they described a sort of a meteor appeared in the sky. And that meteor looks like a, uh, a mouse, and it has a long tail. And every time the telco went out in a certain city, all the people died. And the same description he found in the papyrus of Egypt. They described the same thing, that something unusual happened. And then he found the same description in the Maya uh, documents, the Maya in southern, uh, southern uh, United America, and they describe the same thing about this phenomena, which is strange. So this way, uh, Judea, the kingdom of Judah, you know, stayed alive. Then the competition between Babylon and um, Egypt started on and on. Babylon came to Judea, and they made an agreement with them. And they said, you be our buffer, help us and we'll help you against Egypt. And uh, Judea accepted that. The Babylonians were very much astonished by the advanced system of life in Judea and the way the Jews lived. So they requested that some craftsmen and expert goes with them back to Babylon. And so the king agreed and they went, 10,000 went to Babylon at the time. Then <coughs> Egypt advanced. So uh, Babylon was too late to, uh, to react. The king of Judea said to the Egyptian, I will accept you as a friend and I will neglect the agreement with Babylon. So what happened? Babylon heard they came with a strong army. 
The, the Babylonians were more advanced in terms of weaponry than the Egyptians. So they finished the army of Pharaoh, and the remaining army ran away, and they came and besieged Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was besieged for two years, up to a point that no food was in, the, in Jerusalem. So the king and his entourage succeeded in running away. So the word came to Nebuchadnezzar, who was camping a bit far away from Jerusalem. He said, well, we have to run and capture the king. And the king, the Judaic king, was captured. Once he brought before uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he said, some people say, he said, knock his eyes and put him in a couple chains and we take him to Babylon as a prisoner. And he has three sons, he said, cut their head in front of him. And they were killed. So some other people, even in the Bible, there was a different story. It says that they didn't knock the, his eyes, they took him to Babylon and he, they put him in a prison for a period of time. And he requested that he carry on his back a bag with the soil of Jerusalem so that when he died, they put it in his grave. And Nebuchadnezzar agreed. The distance between Jerusalem and Babylon was more or less close to the distance between Montreal and Toronto. The only difference is that there is no people living in that area and the distance between. The uh, Syrian desert was very treacherous. It was very hard. Why? Because, uh, because uh, uh, first of all, when you walk, it is just like walking in snow. You go deep in the, in the sand and, and it's very hard to walk in this situation. On top of that, there are all kinds of scorpions and uh, snakes that has the same color of the, of the sand and you cannot figure out where they come from and one sting will kill the person. And in addition to that, there were also quicksand where you walk and all in a sudden the uh, ground starts to swallow people and they cannot uh, be saved. And not only that, there were also some vicious animals. They find their leisure in picking up anyone to eat. But finally, they arrived to Babylon. They arrived to Babylon and at that time, the leader was Jeremiah. Jeremiah wanted to tell them, listen, uh, Babylon is a, like a paradise. You have a lot of uh, uh, very fer good fertile soil, you can uh, stay there. And he introduced the sentence that we hear always in wedding, kol sason ve kol simha. He wanted them to feel happy. But then he returned to Jerusalem. But the Jews, instead of being happy about the new situation, they sat down beside the river and sang their famous song by the rivers of Babylon. We sat down and we cried for the memory of our, uh, of our Zion. So it was very hard for them to adjust despite the luxuries and the way of life they had. But at that time, there was a great leader. A great leader was Ezekiel. Ezekiel looked at the situation and he tried to find out a language that he can to talk to the people. The first thing that he did, simply established the synagogue. The synagogue was established by him. He built up the first synagogue and he convinced the king, the Jewish king exiled, to give him half the uh, the soil that he brought from Jerusalem to put it as a foundation of this synagogue. And he called the synagogue Kehillah uh, Kedusha. And this title you find in all the synagogues in the world. Just like saying it is a sort of uh, imitation of the, uh, of the Beta Mikdash. So the Jews has to come to the synagogue and wearing the talit and equally a stay and a pray. That was something that put people together. It's a sort of, they have a sort of a common problem.
the common problem is they lost everything. They lost hope, they lost the friends, they lost families, they lost possession, and now they are told, here we are, you have a country rich enough, live here. But you know, uh, Ezekiel was a smart guy. Instead of telling them, like Jeremiah, look at the richness of Babylon, he didn't do that. He prepared a sort of a, um, a, a sort of a prayer, and that the prayer was a very smart system of attracting people and getting through their memory and their way of thinking. Instead of telling them, look, everything is fine, he told them, no, not the fact. He told them, look at our past. Our past, God help Abraham, God help uh, Jacob, God help, help the Jews to come from Egypt and help them, and God help everybody, everybody who is weak and everybody who is, you know, not just the, the powerful. That was the first step. People understand that. Why? Because if you tell them something else, it doesn't click. It will click when you talk to their level of thinking. And this is what is did. And what I'm telling you, you now, it is the analysis of one of famous psychologists about Jewish prayer. He said the Jewish prayer, that even what we do today, is composed, in fact, of three parts. The first part is the past. Look at the past, look at the glory of the past, look at the help of the God, of God. And then he moved, but the past cannot be uh, returned, cannot be repeated. What happened now is that the past give us a lesson to learn. We learn from the past, we cannot repeat the past. The other portion of prayer, uh, praising God and his power, and how we can do things and how we can change things and miracle. Now, the future, is unpredictable, it's a mystery. No one can know what is the future. So our concentration has to be not the past which is dead, not the future which is a mystery, but the present. Live in the day you are. Do whatever you can today, because this will give you a good life, a good solution for the, your problems today, and an anticipation for a good future. That was the basic of our prayer today and many thousands of years ago. Within the ages, the language, the prayers were a bit modified. For example, in the year 333, when uh, I come to this later, 333 BC. BC, yeah, uh, when the uh, when the uh, Persian. Uh, succeeded to come back to and capture uh, Babylon from the hands of the uh, of the Greek, and the uh, Persian accused the Jews of being collaborating with the enemy. Uh, what happened? There was a rabbi who negotiated with the Persian, and he said, "Look, we are going to put an item in our prayer, appraising the country and the government that hosts us." And that is the prayer that today we use in Saturday on even high holidays we praise the country that give us, you know, shelter. On top of that, within time, there were all kinds of additions to the, uh, to the uh, prayer. For example, we all know Adon Ulam. Adon Ulam was a poet that was written by uh, Shlomo ben Gabriel in the, in the year 1200 before the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. And he was a genius in writing poetry in both Hebrew and Arabic. And the poet that he wrote is so nice that, that people agreed to make it at the end of our prayer. There was another thing. There was in the year 800, and 47, there was a rabbi in Babylon, Gaon uh, Amra. Uh, he said, we better start to make standardization of the prayer, that the Jews pray the same way in all countries. So introduce the prayer or uh, the uh, standardization of the prayer. It's almost the same in all Jewish communities. And that was in the year 847. There were also some Jewish poems 
poems that uh, wrote nice poems and it was part of the Bible. For example, in Rosh Hashanah, we all sing the, the famous song of Al uh, Hamizbeah, Okay, Ven Yaqad, Ven Mizbeah. This song was, uh, was very nicely sang by two people of our community, uh, Sean Corwin and Robert Dawood. And that song was, in fact, introduced in the year about 850 by a rabbi in Babylon. His name was Yehuda Shmuel Abbas. The name Abbas is quite uh, strange because it's a Muslim name, but still he was, that's his name. And last but not least, in the prayer of, uh, of um, uh, Yom Kippur, we all remember the song Hanna'ila. The song, was, the poem was written by Rabbi Yehuda Levi, also before. And notice something very interesting in the words of Yehuda Levi. He picked up part of sentences of the Bible and he made his song. And you may remember when he said to God, if we are your children, love us with the love of parents to his child. Which means, you know, he knows that it was in the Bible that the love of a parent to their child is something so strong that cannot be stopped. And what happened? From where he get the idea? The idea he got it from King David. When King David was king in, Jude in Judea, um, his son Absalom wanted to make a revolution and get rid of his father. So he uh, picked up a number of uh, people and he started fighting against his father. David sent a uh, division to teach him a lesson and in the battle, in the battle, Absalom was killed. So they came and they told King David, the battle won, but your son Absalom was killed. So King David, instead of being happy, he tore his clothes and he made the famous song, Absalom Bini Bini Absalom, Mi Yiten Et Moti Ani Ta'atikha. My son Absalom, my son Absalom, why I didn't die instead of you? And the tradition of the Jews to tear down the clothes comes from that time. When in, in the time of mourning, they tear, they tear down the clothes. And, it missed, and our uh, Yehuda Halil, he understand that, he introduced the words in his poem. And this is our uh, prayers. Now, Judaism lasted thousands of years and will continue. But the trouble is today, we don't understand Judaism. The mistake is with us. We think that we understand everything, but we don't understand Judaism. The channels of communication between the past and the present is very weak. We don't have time to sit down and read and find the beauty of the words that were written and the beauty behind the words, the message that Judaism had. Anyhow, we come back to our friends in Babylon. The Jews, based on all kinds of archaeological things, the Jews of Babylon settled there, as well as they were entrenched in all kinds of places. According to the Talmud, there were at about 15 places where the Jews were settled, and they are all between the Tigris and the Euphrates. And all these areas were very uh, fertile. Why fertile? Because the the uh, Tigris and the Euphrates, when they have a flood, they bring with them all kinds of uh, clay from the mountains, and then that clay is very fertile. And the Jews were prospered there. But not only that, but the Jews, based on archaeological documents, they were entrenched in all kinds of businesses and all kinds of uh, way of life. The Jews had a bank, believe it or not, bank by Jacob Morasho and Sons. The name of the bank was MTB, but it's different from the banks of today. That bank was used as a sort of like a notary to keep up document and to assure that agreements work. For, for example, 
They found a, one of the document of that bank, a family wanted to uh, adopt a child. So in order to prove they have the financial ability, they wrote an agreement and put in the bank certain uh, pieces of gold or, uh, or, uh, or silver to show they have the financial ability to uh, have the child adopted. Why they did that? The reason is very simple. They might adopt the child and then sell it as a slave. And they didn't want that. So they want to hook them to show that they really have the ability to take care of the child. The documents of that bank, there were 350 tablets made of clay, burned clay. They found them by accident in Babylon in 1924 by a um, expedition coming from London and uh, who wanted to do archaeological digging, archaeological digging in Babylon. It was raining around Hala. They said, when we go, there were about 10, 15 people. They found a tent. They went to the tent. There was a, um, a shepherd there. He would come there. He said, well, uh, you can stay with me until the, uh, the storm is over. They found something interesting. They found there is a sort of a pathway from his tent a few uh, steps ago, and all these are made of uh, uh, burned clay. They took one of it, look at it, and said there is a universe that is something written. They said to him, where do you get that? He said, well, it was there in one of the, of the uh, hills. It was raining, and I discovered that, and I made a good use of them. I used them as a stepping stone to my, to my, uh, you know, to my tent. He said, are you ready to sell this? He said, yes. If you give me two pennies for each one, I will sell it to you. And he sold that to them, and they took it to England for deciphering. And they uh, deciphered some of these uh, uh, tablets. I don't want to go into details because it's interesting to see the way of life at that time. Okay? Now, the Jews, more, they, what was the idea of, of uh, um, Ezekiel, the prophet? Not only he built up the synagogue, not only he made the prayer, he said, we have to look for the future. What is the future? So the future needs someone educated who can lead the, the community. So, they, and, the, and their education has to be free. The community has to pay for educating those people. So they built up three uh, yeshivas in Babylon. Surah, one of them, Pompadita, another one, and Yardaya, the third one. The, the, those yeshiva are around the city of Babylon, a few miles away, not more. And those yeshiva has a rabbi, they call him Gaon. Gaon in Hebrew means a genius. And they sit down in that yeshiva in a sort of a semicircle. The, student, the students that are clever sit down in the first row, the others sit later. And they learn the Bible. But the way they learn is something very strange and very interesting. They are not allowed to learn things by heart. You read a statement and you ask the questions. By asking many questions, you can develop new things, new ideas, and new, and new areas. And that was the, the secret of learning and science in the Jewish community. The student who excelled the others during the year was given the priority to marry the daughter of the rabbi. That was something uh, great at that time. Now, <coughs> the, the Jews stayed under the Babylonian until the Persian came. The Persian came under Koresh, the king of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Persia. At that time, the name was Persia and not Iran. He came, when he came, he surrounded the area. The Babylonian were defeated. And the Jewish community came to see Koresh, and they showed him um, the writing of the prophet Daniel, who 50 years before predicted that there will be a defeat of Babylon and that Persia will certainly succeed to capture Babylon. So the king was very happy, and even he appointed some of the Jews to be his helpers and his, 
you know, his uh, advisors. The Jews continued like that uh, for quite a long period of time until the year 331 when Alexander the Great came. Ah, before that, I want to say that the, Persian, the Babylonian named the head of the Jews, the king, the deposed king, uh, the Roshel Gelut, the head of the, uh, of the diaspora. Why? Because he had to take care of the taxes collected from the Jews. So he was in fact a sort of employee under the, um, under the Babylonian. Okay? Now Alexander the Great came. He captured Babylon. Alexander called the area Mesopotamia, which means the country of the Twin Rivers. In fact, the name Twin Rivers was already in the Bible, but in different ways. It was called the land of Shinar. The, 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 the word Shinar is a, two words in ancient Aramaic. It means two rivers. And so Alexander the Great used the same. And he called Rosh Galut Exilar. Exilar is Rosh Galut in, uh, in the uh, in the, in the Greek language. Alexander the Great loved the Jews. They were very capable people and they were very honest, hardworking, and one of his generals recommended that he takes 200 families, Jewish families, and send them to uh, Cappadocia. Cappadocia, this is Asia Minor of today, and make them the honorary, uh, honorary guards for the for the kingdom. And so he did. And they took them to an area in Cappadocia called Sepharad. And from there, the name Sepharad came to, uh, for many uses. Anyhow, Alexander the Great was very amb ambitious. He wanted to attack Persia. Persia at that time was a sort of uh, advanced country. They have a religion called Zoroaster. And Zoroaster is a religion that in certain aspect is similar to Judaism. They believe that there are two powers in the world, one good, one evil, and there is always a competition between the two who is going to succeed. But they can, one cannot succeed. If the good succeed, then people will see everything good, they will take it for granted. If the evil succeed, no. Because if evil succeed, then that's the end of the world. Therefore, there must be a power holding those two, not giving anyone to succeed. And that power, unique power, is called Ahura Mazda. And that's the god of the, of the Zoroaster. The main difference between Judaism and Zoroaster is the burial. The Jews bury their dead, the Zoroaster don't bury their dead. They took the dead body to a high tower and the priests cut it into pieces and let the vultures come and eat it. And even today, they do the same. Okay? Now, uh, while we are at this stage, Ezekiel had a certain idea. He said, now we have a synagogue that put people together. They put together put them together. Why? Because they have a common reason. They are all sad. They all, you know, have a common uh, factor. What are we going to do when we are going back? What is the promise that God help us all the time? Where is it? And then he said, the, 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 the synagogue put people together. When they get together, they spoke to each other, and they spoke to each other, each one, and understand that his problem is not the only problem in the world. There are some people with more difficult problem. But more than that, he increased a sort of, uh, a sort of uh, cooperation. There was no money at that time. So when, if one farmer has a lot of uh, uh, crop one year and the other has little crop, the one with the too much crop can give it to his neighbor. And this way, you know, they can live together. If there was money, he could have sold the excess of his crop by money. But there was no money. Therefore, there is no money that becomes, make people more friends, more friendly. But then came another prophet, Ezra. Ezra said, 
In the Holy Land, most of the people uh, come once or twi twice or three times a year to Jerusalem and worship uh, a God, and they heard the uh, Kohanim uh, <coughs> uh, singing the Torah. Now we are in the diaspora. The Kohanim are not protected. What happens if they die? Then the Torah will be finished. Nobody will remember. So he decided to write the Torah. He, when he wrote the Torah, he copied the Persian. The Persian had a certain kind of uh, religious document written on calf skin with gold leaf, with gold leaf. But he said, no, we'll write the Torah or also on uh, calf skin, but written with a special kind of ink. That ink was made out of the, the flowers of the cedar trees, burned and crushed into soot. They add to them um, vegetable oil and mix them together, they become a sort of an ink. But he said they are going to write it on parchment, on I mean on uh, calf skin. And instead of holding the pencil like that, and their hands will be on the skin and blot it because uh, it is hot and they uh, get uh, uh, get sweat. We have to hold the pen the perpendicularly and write it. But what what he find is that. Despite that, their hands will be smudged. So he decided that writing the Torah has to be close to a mikveh. And every time the sofer finished a sentence or a few words and his hands are uh, smudged, he go to the mikveh, he, uh, he washed and come back. And this is the tradition even today. They have to, uh, to write the, the Torah very close to a place where they can wash their hand. Anyhow, Ezra succeeded. The way the Torah was written was in, in a very, very strange way. There was no space between words, no space between sentences, and no uh, paragraphs. You start with one word and end up with the, other, with the, with the last word. The five books, books of Moses was written like that. Ezra found it very hard to use ancient uh, letters. Hebrew letters to write the Bible. So what he did, he used the square letters that used by Assyria. The Hebrew letters of today that we have in Sefer Torah and the books, they are not Hebrew. Those are Assyrian letters. It is easy to write them because they are square. Instead of writing the uh, Aleph with all kinds of uh, circle, you write it just in three strokes. But what happened? is that we lose the way the, we pronounce the words. There are the letters in the Assyrian that are not similar to the letters in Hebrew. Yeah. So they tried to uh, overcome that, they couldn't. We don't know if the Babylonian Jews has the best accent of the Hebrew, of ancient Hebrew, maybe they do. But other communities in the world, especially the East European, they can read Hebrew in a way that you don't understand it. It is far away from the Hebrew that we used in the Sephardi uh, congregation. Anyhow, uh, Ezra succeeded in having several copies of the Bible, and he decided to go to all Jewish communities and give them a copy, so that it would be unique and all of them use the same. He arrived to Israel near the area of the Shomeronim. Shomeronim, they are Jews that exist today in uh, Samaria, and they have different kind of uh, tradition, Jewish tradition. They don't consider themselves Jews, but Israel considers them as Jews based on the definition of Judaism. They are Jews, and they have to serve in the army. So what happened, the Samaritans said to them, to him, we don't use your, we use our own script. They use also the five books of Moses, but written in the ancient uh, thing. Then he told them about the tzitzit, the, the, that we put, the shawl we put in. He said, no, we have different tradition. On Friday until Saturday evening, we wear a sort of a blouse, which is uh, like a checker with white and black. 
and this is the symbol of our uh, of our tzitzit. We don't want yours. Then he said to them, "You get married to non-Jewish girls. You have to get to divorce them." They said, "No way. We are not going because we are lacking uh, uh, girls, and we have to accept non-Jewish girls as well." What they have in their tradition, if a Jewish girl, if a non-Jewish girl lives with them 40 days and respects the way of life, she turned automatically Jewish. And that's the way they are. And he refused that. So he insulted them, they insulted him, and he went down to Yemen. In Yemen, he gave the Jewish community a copy of uh, the Bible. The Jews of Yemen were not that happy with him. And also there was misunderstanding, but he left them a copy and returned back to Babylon when a few years after he died. Anyhow, the Bible, the Torah, was written like that and stayed for nearly a thousand years without a space between uh, words, without a space between, uh, between uh, the sentences, and the reader has to know to read it just like that and uh, do it himself, he can understand it. A thousand years later, someone spent 30, 25 or 40 years of his life to make a space between words and to make uh, a sort of a difference between sentence and paragraphs. Then they find the problem with the pronunciation. There are words in the Bible that are pronounced and written the same way, but if you add punctuation in different ways, they, they mean differently. So that was a real work for the rabbis for many, many years. Okay, I'll give you just a simple example. <clears throat> when God decided that Adam would come out of paradise, he said to him, you go out and you work with your uh, hands because uh, you have to appreciate what you are doing. But to uh, Eve, he said differently. He said to her, the word Sa'a in Aramaic, it's not in Iraqi Arabic. In Iraqi Arabic it means suffering, in Aramaic it means labor. He said, you will bring, give birth with labor. You will love your husband, or So which word do we use? Yimshol Bach or Yimshol Bach? Yimshol Bach means he control your life, he enslave you. But this is not the intention. His, the purpose was Yimshol Bach, which means the woman will be an exemplary in the family. She teach her children manners, she teach, teach the care of her children, her, her husband and her family. Therefore, we have to use the different, the second explanation. Then you have some things in the Bible was translated, not exactly when they translated the Bible to English. They say, if you find a good person in this community, it is just like finding a camel that can go through the eye of a needle. Mm. Now it is, you know, what, what kind of camel can go through the eye of a needle? In fact, there is a problem here. The word gamal in Hebrew means uh, a camel. But the word gamal means a thick rope of which they make the, uh, the, uh, the, the nets for fishing. So if you find it, it's more logical to think that it's Ramal, which is a rope, and not Gamal, which is a, a camel. Okay? These are some of the examples that uh, created a kind of controversy among all kinds of our people. Okay? Uh, Alexander the Great is now in uh, Babylon. He wanted to capture uh, Persia. He went to Persia, he captured it, he devastated the country. He took all their Bible, the, which is called Avista, and burned it. Uh, the Avista, as a matter of fact, is uh, three times thickness of the five books of Moses. It's very thick. It includes all kinds of guidelines of people, how to live, how to behave. Okay? Then he captured the king, and the king has a beautiful daughter, her name was Oksana. He fell in love with her and he decided to marry Oksana. 
And this is the great commander in the world. He captured many countries, he defeated many armies, but his heart surrendered unconditionally before the smile of a beautiful woman. And this is in fact the nature of all men since Adam was born and he saw Eve for the first time. <laughs> Alexander the Great decided to come back to uh, Babylon and continue. He wanted to go to India. He had some problem. He wanted to come back. And Alexander the Great, although he was taught by one of the best philosophers in the world, his name was Aristotle, uh, Alexander the Great had a great belief in astrology. He never do anything before consulting an astrologist. So he called one astrologist and he said, what is the best way for me to go back to Babylon? The astrologist looked at the stars, made his calculation. He said, the best way is to go through the swamps because there are no enemies there. Okay, he went back through the swamps. Okay, and then he attacked the malaria. He came back to Babylon in about a month. He, was, he had a very bad fever and he died. So they put him in a coffin made of gold and carried him to Alexandria, Egypt, where he was buried. Anyhow, his kingdom was divided between his people. Two of his generals, one took Syria, the Holy Land, and Egypt, and the other took Babylon. The one in Babylon was not as strong. What happened? After a while, the Persian understood that he's going to fall apart, so they attacked him and captured Babylon again. In the Holy Land, the commander was a bit stronger. And I would like to mention just a few anecdotes about that commander in, uh, in the Holy Land. That commander had his uh, capital in Alexandria and his taxes on the Jews every year was very simple. 22 beautiful girls aged 12 to 14, each carrying a tray made of gold. And that was the kind of taxes he imposed on Jews. And when they go there, they have to surrender and give him the, the uh, uh, trays and they become his own concubine. One day, the Jewish uh, in charge of taxes, took those girls, he went to uh, Alexandria. And the, the uh, commander was eating at that time, eating uh, uh, lamb. And one of his people sitting and he said, look, commander, you know what this Jewish people, Jewish person is doing to his people? He's doing like you. He eats the, the flesh and leaves just the bones to throw in the garbage. And this is what is happening in the Holy Land. Anyhow, they wanted to involve the Jews in a Greek life. First, they wanted them to be part of the Olympic Games. At the beginning, the Jews say yes, and after that, they said no. Why? To participate in the uh, game, the players has to go, first of all, to bow before the goddess. And then they have to play it naked, without any clothes. So right away they can identify the Jewish player and be subject to be killed. They will be killed first and foremost. Because we can find out they are Jewish, okay? Then they tried another way. They said, well, we make them accepting the Greek culture, and they couldn't. So one person said, let me do it this way. Let us take a Greek scientist and let him live with the Jews. And let, let us find out why the Jews cannot accept Hellenism. So they picked up a uh, scholar, a Greek scholar, and told him, go and live with the Jews for one year and then come up with your report. After a few months, he came and he said, I can give you my report in few words. He said, how come? It's so very simple. Jews are those people who love what non-Jews hate and hate what non-Jews love. So there is no, nothing in common. We cannot, we cannot convert them to Judaism. 
anyhow, we come. That and, and probably you know the story about uh, <coughs> about the uh, the Jews, how the how the Maccabi fought, and uh, I have nothing to do with that. But let me continue in Babylon. <coughs> the uh, Persian came, and they uh, captured Babylon from the Greek, and they uh, accused the Jews. You collaborated with the enemy. Therefore, you are not independent and self-ruled as before. We don't uh, want you to have a sort of a leader among you to be Rosh Kelut, head of the of the diaspora. And the head of the diaspora would be a Persian, one of us, and will treat you the way we like. So what happened? Some of the Jews rebelled. They, uh, they captured them. There were two brothers and a cousin. They were called. They were from one family, so they were brought to justice, and they decided to hang them. And those were the three first Jews were hanged because they respected the idea of freedom. Okay. Now um, the Jews continued like that. They don't have they don't have any freedom. They don't have any kind of uh, 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 behavior which uh, let them, you know, feel they are um, alone and they are not uh, uh, treated badly. And they continued like that in Persia. And from that time, after a few uh, uh, a few years, uh, what happened? Christianity came. Christianity came, and that had a real impact on Babylon, not only in the Jews, but at the Jews as well. Since people were desperate, the moment they are told Jesus is the Son of God, they say, well, we accept that, and they converted. Now, what about the Jews? Some of the rabbis of the Jews, they said, based on the Bible, this could be true. So they converted. And at that time, the word Mar, like Mar Yosef, Mar Yaakov, etc., that was given to any Jew who graduated from the yeshiva. Who used that? The new Christian used the title Mar as a <coughs> sort of a rabbi or a priest. So the Jews has to change the title instead of calling the uh, Jew um, Mar, they call him Rabbi, and uh, Hacham. And the term Hacham started from that time on. Now, Christianity spread all over the, all over Babylon. And there were a number of types of Christianity, not one type as we think. There were the Chaldean, Chaldean Christian, there were Assyrian Christian, there were the, uh, the, the Christian Orthodox, Christian and the last kind of Christian, which is very inter inter interesting, it's called the Nestorian uh, Christian. What are the Nestorian Christian? And from so many Jews, uh, you know, were attracted by them and converted. Nestorian Christian are those Christian who believe that Christ is a great leader, but he cannot be the Son of God. They said there is a difference between heaven and earth. We cannot mix the two. Anyhow, it is surprising to know that for several years, a Christian and Jews prayed in the same synagogue. And then when Roman turned to be Christian and adopted Christianity as a religion, so they decided to establish their own church. And now you have two competing people. You have the Jews on one side and the Christian on the other side. Now, Rome wanted to consolidate their power. They called the Christian. The Chaldean, they accepted Rome. The, uh, the uh, Assyrian accepted. The, uh, Rome, the uh, uh, Christian uh, Orthodox, no, they were a uh, Christian, they were a church by its own. The Nestorian said, well, this is what we believe. We don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They said to them, go out. We don't want you. 
But later on, after many years, the Nestorian accepted the power of the Vatican to give them a sort of a protection, but they stay keeping on the same kind of belief. Now, because they become majority in the southern Iraq, the Persian made a sort of a visa, which means a governor, who is a Christian Nestorian. And the, the, their kingdom, uh, or semi-kingdom under the Persian, lasted for about uh, a little less than 100 years. And the, one of the kings, which, by the name of Munda III, he wanted to introduce what is called uh, what, what is called uh, uh, ideas of the Bible in leading the country. He said, I will not increase the taxes uh, just like that arbitrarily. I will pose a sort of a question to the community. If the rabbi can answer me and prove that I am wrong, I will not increase the taxes. If the rabbi proves that I am right, I will double the taxes. So one day, he called the rabbi of the Jewish community and he said, look, the question is very simple. Can a baby learn how to talk without the help of his mother? The rabbi said, of course not. He said, prove it to me. He said, okay. So they went out in the areas where there were Jewish community and they heard a woman screaming, giving birth to a baby. They knock on the door and they said, we have to take the baby. She gave birth to a baby boy. They said, we are going to keep the baby in the, in the court of the king. You are allowed to come as many times as you want to breastfeed him and go. But you are not allowed to talk to him, not a single word. So what she can do? She accepted that. So they took the baby to the court. And every now and then she came to breastfeed the baby. And, and she was looked out, guarded by some guards. So without let them looking at her, she used to whisper in the ear of the baby, oh, why you come now to such a cruel world? And she continued like that. After three years, the governor said, what happened to the baby? Come, prove your point. So they brought the baby to the court, and looked at him and said, what is your name? He didn't know, couldn't answer. Well, who are you? He didn't answer. And the governor said, well, take him back. So the soldier who came to carry the baby, his lips came close to the ears of the baby. So all of a sudden the baby said, why you come now to such a cruel world? He repeated what his mother put in his ears. And so the Jews did not pay double taxes. Now, what happened, the king of Persia had all kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, spies those spies watch all the governors in all the districts. If they find that certain governor is not behaving the way they want it, so very simple. He replaced him, not just replaced him, he called him and thanked him. So the spies went and they said, this Christian governor wants to be independent. He wanted to, in fact, to get rid of you. So, you better do whatever you like to do. So he called him to uh, his uh, court. And the second day, they found him hanged at the, at the gate. The Persian who would have said, I will appoint someone that I want. And he told him, you have to be so cruel to people that just mentioning your name will make people shiver. Don't, you know, uh, pay attention. Young, old, kill. They have a free hand. So one after the other, they were very cruel. One of them had a real passion to young girls. He used to keep a number of young girls. They have to people has people to go and find out the girls and identify whose family has a beautiful young girl. They took it. He kept the girls. He spent the night with the girl, in the morning, before she opens her eyes, he takes his sword and cut her head. And his, uh, and his uh, soldiers, his soldiers came, carry the body, and throw it in a cage full of wild beasts to eat it. 
So the Jews were in a very hard situation. If they decided to hide their daughters, someone will tell finally that they have a daughter. So the whole family would be thrown alive in the cave, in the cage of the beasts. So some of the, of the parents decided to maim their daughters, either they burn her hand or do anything that makes her ugly or not suitable for that. And that continued for quite a period of time. At the same time, they tried maybe the girl can be married at an early age, at the age of nine, ten. They tried to find out the husband for their daughter. That situation continued for a while, and the Jews didn't know what to do. All in a sudden, two people came. They pretend to be rabbis from Eretz Israel. They said, we are rabbis from Eretz Israel. We are messengers. We have a message for you. The time has come to take you with us to Eretz Israel on the wings of eagle. He said, you know, it is written in the book of uh, Ezekiel that God will take you back to Eros Israel on the wings of eagles. So people were very happy. They spoke their language. And uh, those two people pretend to be really honest. So everyone invited them. It was an honor to invite them to dine and wine. Then they asked them, when is the right date to go to Eros Israel? said, well, wait, the time will come and we'll tell you. One day, they came, they called the Jews to the synagogue and said, the time has come, you have to be ready. said, you go on your roof, you stay at your roof, you cover yourself with a, a, a green blanket, and the eagle will come, settle down, you go on his wings, and will take you to Eros Israel. I said, but there is one technical problem here. You, you Baghdadi Jews, are, uh, are blessed with many children. Every family has 10, 12 children, plus the parent, plus the grandparent. The eagle cannot carry all of you, in addition to the uh, treasure that you have. What we suggest, we give you your treasure, put it in a, ba in a uh, parcel, write your name on it, We'll take you with a, take the treasure with our uh, uh, the eagle and go to Eros Israel. When you get there to Yerushalayim, we'll uh, uh, come and claim your uh, package and you will be happy as ever. So people believe that and many of them uh, package their uh, belonging, their, their uh, wife's uh, jewelry, their uh, gold and silver and prepare it for them. They took it. And what happened? Yes, they sat down upstairs to, uh, on the roof waiting for the eagle to come. And they waited and waited and the eagle never came. So finally they realized those were swindlers. They took their money and ran away and left the community empty pockets, very much disappointed, but the eternal song stayed in their heart next year in Jerusalem. Okay? The situation continued like that until a new wave came. That wave came when Islam came into being. They come to capture uh, Baghdad in the year 633. Now what happened here before, when the Jews found themselves in a difficult situation in Babylon, secretly they dismantled the uh, the uh, synagogue and took it, established Baghdad. Baghdad was in fact built by the Jews. The word Baghdad is a two words in Persian. It means the city of gardens. And they built up the synagogue there and that synagogue stayed even today. It is the same synagogue. And it was at a certain time when the rabbis of Baghdad wanted to show the world that this is the first synagogue ever built in the world. Unfortunately, they didn't find anyone listening. At the stage, it it's falling apart. Anyhow, um, okay, the Arabs came and they captured Baghdad. And the Jews supported them with all their heart. 6,000 uh, young Jews were killed, 
in capturing Baghdad from the hands of the Persian. Why? Because they were in such a bad situation. Any newcomer is welcome. So they supported, they supported the Arabs. The Arabs came, captured Baghdad, and they saw the Jews, and they welcomed the Jews. They give them all kinds of high positions, up to a point that the, the uh, leader, one of the leaders of the Jews, his grave is still in Baghdad. Uh, they gave him the title of Sheikh, Sheikh Ishaq, who is buried in Hanuni in Baghdad, in the old part of the city. Well, he was, he was not only uh, advisor to the king, he was also a treasurer, he was also a doctor. And when he came to the court of the, of the governor, a music band came in front of him, playing a music, announcing the coming of a representative of our great master, King David. And he sat on a chair beside the governor, which means it's a very good position. That situation continued, continued for a while. And the Jews had a good time. But what happened? As you know, the Jews, they have this kind of traditional food they do every Saturday, uh, Friday night, preparing for Sunday. It's the, the kind of uh, it's the kind of uh, uh, dish which is called the tweet. They prepare the tweet and then they put it on the terrace. The terrace was uh, approachable by people who ride horses and they cover it. But the smell is so nice because the Jews, after so many years using the same dish, dish they know how to mix spices. Spices so that the, the, the aroma will be very strong. So what happened, the, the uh, soldiers of the Arab came, and when they smelled the nice aroma, they snatched the pot with the food. So the Jews can have no food for Saturday. So they went to their leader and they said, look, this is the situation. So the, the leader, Sheikh Ishaq, went to the uh, Muslim governor and said, this is a situation where people cannot eat Saturday because your people are snatching the food from them. So the Muslim uh, governor said, this is a fatwa. No Muslim is allowed to eat the food of Jews. So the Jews have a good time, they can eat. Few years later, the leader of the Jews died, the leader of uh, the uh, Muslim died, and the priest, the Muslim priest said, why we cannot eat the food of the Jews? Let us try to find a reason. We have no reason left for us. So they think and think and said, ah, we cannot eat the food of the Jews because the Jews are dirty. And from that time, the, the world coined dirty Jew. They are not allowed to eat the food of the Jews. They are not allowed to be close by Jews. When it is raining, the Jew has stayed at home. And the Jew has to build up his uh, wall lower than the wall of the Jews in his house, and the world spread in all the Islamic world. Okay? Now, there were all kinds of, for 200 years, the Iraqi or Baghdadi Jews were governed by the Amawid uh, section of the Islam. Then the Abbasid people came, and this is a new era. The leader of the Abbasid, when he came, he said, ah, Baghdad, this is the, the belly button of civilization. It is the best country, best city I ever see. And, he, and the two rivers are, in fact, the vein of civilization. So he called it Iraq. And that was the name given to Iraq. Iraq means the vein, the vein, the arteries of civilization. So from that time on, the name Iraq was coined in the state of Babylon, and the Jews had a new kind of life. Time was on. The Jews were busy writing the Talmud. It took 400, 500 years to finish the Talmud, until the year 499. When the Talmud was uh, published, and it was studied in many places, 
the, the Talmud has a certain kind of mission. It is not only a sort of religious ideas, it is also a sort of a legal idea. And this is a very nice thing that the Jews introduced. What is the Talmud? The Talmud are cases studies, cases that were brought before the rabbi, the rabbis negotiated that, and then make a, a decision, the, a verdict. They are not, they, those, were, those cases were not arranged in a sort of subject or under titles. It comes at random. When it comes, it is used. But those cases, not only, not all of them had a decision or a sort of a conclusion. Some of them are just like a, a statement, a analysis, and that's it. So the question is why? Is there a case without conclusion? How can we do things like that? And the logic of the people who wrote the Talmud is this. When you make a decision you de in any subject, your decision is based on two factors. One is the facts in front of you. The facts never change. And second is the explanation to facts. Explanation to facts is different from one community to the other, from one generation to the, to the other. If the type of a problem has a certain facts that can be uh, explained differently, we don't make any decision. We make it to the next generation, to other communities, to find the situation and make up the decision. And this gives a real flexibility a real flexibility in any kind of, uh, of uh, legal decisions. Now, there is another thing. The Bible, the Talmud, dealt with all kinds of uh, questions. One of the questions is, to whom you give the credit when you produce something? Suppose you want to make a table. You bring all the materials, you put it in front of you, and say to them, be a table. They can't buy themselves. You need a carpenter, an expert, to put them together and make the table. Therefore, the credit goes to the person who gives the last touch. It is not the person who gathered the pieces, but the person who makes a real shape out of everything. Now, that seems a sort of an idea that they play. But see the impact of this idea. When the Jews ran away from Spain, one Jewish family settled in England. That family, generation after generation, they had a sort of a son who is very smart, but he couldn't get anywhere because he is Jewish. Well, what he can do? One day he decided to give up, and he decided to marry a Christian girl and become Christian. When he became a Christian, the doors of progress were open before him. He becomes a member of parliament. He becomes all kinds of a uh, respected leader. Well, at that time, it was the Industrial Revolution. And the change in society was so hard, people didn't know which direction it's going to be. Before, people, they were small farmers, they were happy. Now, the farmer cannot give them a living. They become employees, and employees, it is a different life. So, what he did, he wrote a book. The book was called The Principle of uh, Political Economy and Taxation and Value Added. What is a value added? Not many people know how to read in those days. So the book was put on one of the shelves of the uh, of Cambridge University Library, Gathering Dust. 30, 40 years after that, there was another fellow, also converted Jew, who was g gathering information to find out how to justify the situation of the, of the Industrial Revolution. And he came across this book, and he said, ah, that's the principle of communism. You have to give a credit to labor, because labor is the last person who gives touch to things. And that was Karl Marx. In his writing, he created the theory of communism and the importance of labor. And now you can see how thinking, even many hundreds of years ago, can impact the future. As it is said, it is a drop of ink that 
that can make thousand people think, a drop of ink. And so it was this kind of thing that created uh, the theory of uh, of uh, the theory of uh, communism. Okay, so we spoke about that, but I want to have a few words about uh, the, the, uh, the beginning, the life in Babylon. The rabbi that took care of changing the life of the Jews when the Persian came back was called Rabbi Mar Samuel. That Mar Samuel was a smart fellow. What he did, in fact, the great things, but not many books were written about him. The things that he introduced to Judaism is still we feel it now. First of all, he said, education has to be free. The community has to finance the education. Second, he said, temporary marriages has to be stopped. Because in the past, a Jew can go somewhere, he marry a woman for two, three days, and then he say goodbye. And he said, this has to be stopped. And many rabbis said, no, we cannot accept that. He said, listen, I want to prove to you. If a person, one man, goes with two women, and the two, one had a baby boy and the other a baby girl, and those when they grow up, they get married. It's against the Bible. It's a, a brother marrying his sister. Therefore, we have to stop this. He, they stopped it. And then he said, there is arranged marriages. In those days, if two women are pregnant, one say to the other, if you have a boy, have a girl, when they grow up, they are engaged from the day they were born. He said, you don't put your hand in the fate of a newborn. You are not allowed to do that. Everyone is free. So they stopped that. Now, one thing he did in the area of medicine, he was a real doctor. He said, disease in the world does not happen because there is an evil eye. A person look at you and say, oh, evil eye, I get married. He said, this is wrong. Disease happens because of something invisible that penetrates the body through water, food, and air. And that thing creates the disease. Now, that was very smart from him, because to observe this kind of thing, that is very, very uh, intelligent. Because after a thousand years after that, they discovered that, in fact, the microbe causes the disease and not the evil eye. Well, the other thing he said, he said, you want to be uh, a sort of healthy, if you are sick, don't stay in the city. The air of the city is bad. Go outside the city, in the wilderness, make up your tent, look at nature, put your hands in the hands of nature, and enjoy the nice uh, air of, that nature can give you. Enjoy the creation of nature, you are part of it. Nature is your mother. And you know, the idea of changing this kind of environment where someone is, uh, uh, of, is uh, sick is really something that is even accepted today. Well. I don't want to, it is time to say goodbye. And I, I spoke too much. There are many things to speak more and more. And you know, understand Judaism, especially the young generation. It is not just something that we forget. It is something which is eternal. So keep it in mind and, you know, think about it. Thank you. Please just give us two more minutes. Uh, Monsieur Edmond Baz would like to thank our speaker. And then uh, Lisette uh, Chachot is going to give us a couple of words of Sunday. A big hand to Sami Sorani first. A big hand. Thank 
Krishna for taking care of this wonderful part, part of our history. Yeah. It was so fascinating to listen to you, to the point that I'm planning to go home this afternoon, but rather than taking my Sunday nap, <laughs> I'm going to take some papers and write down what you say. Okay. But I doubt very much if I could remember all the beautiful anecdotes that you say. So, my suggestion to you, our friend Sami, is write that what you say, and we'll be more than happy to publish it for our congregation. And we'll be very, very proud to do that. Sami, this is just me talking from all of us. Okay. Thank you. We are very proud to have you as a member, as an honorary member of our congregation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, as you probably noticed, the, uh, the whole session was uh, filmed. And now I'd like Lisette to come and tell you just for two minutes some words about that particular uh, film that we're taking. Hi everyone, I'm so delighted that you're all here. It's such a nice turnout. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, I always learn from Sami. Anytime I'm asked to speak, I call him and double check the dates and triple check because he knows it all by heart. Uh, and uh, I asked uh, a wonderful friend of ours, Hussein Hadi, to come and tape this for us. So we're going to have it uh, on a stick or DVD. What are we going to do, uh, Hussein? <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, we're going to have it in the archives for everybody, hopefully, and for the ones who missed it, because many people asked me to record it. So we are very lucky to have Hussein here. And we would like to remind everybody so on another subject, the 6th of December, here at the synagogue in the morning, whoever wants to, uh, whoever wants to talk about the history of uh, where where's Muna? Where's Muna. So can you please tell us again? Testimonies are being given by the uh, Jewish Museum here, uh, the, the, the Montreal Jewish Museum. Being recorded by the Jewish Museum. Being recorded by the Jewish Museum. So people who want to give testimonies, uh, of course, Jews from any any country are invited to come. So please do, and uh, we'd love to see you all. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for saying what a pleasure to have, and uh, thank you for being here and helping us out.